We'll now turn to resume the public worship of Almighty God, singing from Psalm 147 and from the beginning. Psalm 147 from the beginning. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good. Praise to our God to sing. For it is pleasant, and to praise it is a comely thing. God doth build up Jerusalem, and he it is alone that the dispersed of Israel doth gather into one. Those that are broken in their heart and grieved in their minds he healeth, and their painful wounds he tenderly upbinds. He counts the number of the stars, he names them every one. Great is our Lord and of great power, his wisdom search can none. The Lord lifts up the meek and casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord and give him thanks. On harp his praises sound. Psalm 147 verses 1 to 7. Praise ye the Lord for it is good. Praise to our God to sing. Praise ye the Lord for it is good. and unite our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Most holy and ever gracious God, the one who inhabits eternity and the one who inhabits the praises of his people. We, Lord, indeed pray for humble and contrite hearts to be within us and for a knowledge of whose present, presence it is that we draw near into. We, Lord, are nothing but sin-sick creatures of the dust. We are so deeply tainted by our sins. We can truly say there is no good thing within us from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. And we can say with prophet of old, that I am even as an unclean thing. And we, Lord, know that no works of our own hands 
can merit the eye or the heart of God. For we are black because of sin. Indeed, even our very intentions, our very actions, our very thoughts, our very words are but sinful. And we, Lord, confess this freely this night, that even on a Sabbath day, that has been given to us as a great gift, that we have sinned in these ways. We, Lord, give thanks that we come before one who is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and slow to wrath, plenteous in mercy and plenteous in redemption. We, Lord, have access to that throne of grace. For that access was purchased by Christ Jesus, the Redeemer of God's elect, who came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost, to save sinners. And we, Lord, give thanks that there is that a Saviour that can meet the need of sinners. O oh Lord, we pray indeed for a, a deeper knowledge of our own sin, that we, O oh Lord, would be driven all the more hastily into the salvation that is offered in Christ, that we, Lord, would learn more of him this night, that we would know more of him in his person and in his work, in his offices. We, Lord, pray that as we turn to the scriptures that the pages that speak of him would be embedded in our minds, yea, further into our very hearts. We give thanks, O Lord, that we have this revelation before us. While we know that the creation in all its glory that so surrounds us each and every day is so clear that it speaks of our own God and our Creator. Yet it is insufficient to teach us the, thing, the things of salvation and that there is a Saviour offered to sinners. And yet before us here in this blessed volume, we have all the promises of God throughout all the generations. And we pray, Lord, that these promises will be laid out to us and that we would take hold of them this night. Lord, how we need encouragement. How we even, though we may be saved sinners here tonight, see ourselves so susceptible to sin. So eager, it seems, to fall into temptation so inclined to do our own thing, to go our own way, rather than the way everlasting. O oh Lord, help us and encourage us, we pray in the gospel this night. May the Spirit be pleased to bless the word to us. We, Lord, pray that we would never do these things in vain, but that the Spirit would indeed be pleased to be with us. We pray, Lord, for every soul gathered here that you'd bless them, in their own individual lives and as families and as a congregation. We pray indeed that uh, you'd bless their attendance and all their work that they seek to do for this congregation, from the youngest even to the oldest. We indeed pray uh, for the young folk as they engage in the youth studies and the Sabbath school. Give thanks, O oh Lord, for provisions and for numbers indeed that attend them. And pray, Lord, that a rich blessing would pour out from them, even in the days of their youth. Oh, Lord, we pray that you'd preserve a people here and the young people round about us. Be with the extended congregation, wherever they may be this night, those who would try to be here but cannot for various reasons. Be with them, we pray. Be with those listening in online and those perhaps much further afield. Pray, indeed, that you'd be with them as well. Pray, Lord, for those known to us in the congregation and elsewhere who are on beds of sickness. Oh, Lord, we pray as the great physician that you would grant healing, that uh, physical healing would be granted. Pray, Lord, for those who are perhaps going through times of discouragement and trial. Oh, Lord, we pray as we consider this morning that they indeed would look to the glory which shall be revealed in the Lord's people and take encouragement. O oh Lord, may Satan flee 
from the hearts of the people of God round about and those whom we love and care for. We pray, O Lord, that Christ would be exalted in all that we seek to do and pray for in our own families. Be with us, O Lord, uh, this night itself. Open up the scriptures we pray to us. May it indeed again be a blessing to our hearts. Go before us the rest of this night. Cleanse us from all our sins. We ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. <coughs> we'll now turn to sing in Psalm 41. <coughs> psalm number 41, and we'll sing from the beginning of the psalm. Psalm 41. Blessed is he that wisely doth, the poor man's case consider. For when the time of trouble is, the Lord will him deliver. God will him keep, yea, save alive. On earth he blessed shall live. And to his enemy's desire, the wealth him not upgive. God will give strength when he on bed of languishing doth mourn. And in a sickness sore, O Lord, the wall his bed will turn. I said, O Lord, do thou extend thy mercy unto me. O do thou heal my soul, for why I have offended thee. Psalm 41, verses 1 to 4, to God's praise. Blessed is he that wisely doth the poor man's case consider. Blessed is he that wisely doth the Turn now in the New Testament to the Gospel of Christ according to Matthew and chapter 9. Gospel according to Matthew and chapter 9. <clears throat> we'll read from the beginning of the chapter. Matthew 9. Let us hear <clears throat> what God the Lord will speak. And Jesus entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. 
But when the multitude saw it, they marvelled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft? But thy disciples fast not. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn, as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come, when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house, and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth, and they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in, and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marvelled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labourers are few. Pay ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labourers into his harvest. Amen. And the Lord once again add his blessing to the reading of his own holy and inspired word. Let us now turn to sing, this time in Psalm 32. <clears throat> psalm 32 and from the beginning of the psalm.
O blessed is the man to whom is freely pardoned all the transgression he hath done, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not his sin, and in whose spirit there is no guile, nor fraud is found therein. When as I did refrain my speech, and silent was my tongue, my bones then waxed old because I roared all day long. And so on down to the end of verse 5. Psalm 32, from the beginning to verse 5. O blessed is the man to whom is freely pardoned all the transgression he hath done. O blessed is the Turn now back to the portion of scripture which we read. The Gospel of Christ according to Matthew and chapter 9. And seeking the help of the Lord, we'll look this evening at the context in the house of Matthew. So we'll read once again from verse 9. Matthew chapter 9 at verse 9. <clears throat> and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew 
sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What we have here in this context is a most wonderful and beautiful scene. We have here in a private home the Lord eating and dining with sinners. Those who have a curiosity arising in their hearts. Those who know that all is not well with their soul and come to inquire about who this Jesus Christ is. His ministry had been noised abroad in earlier, earlier contexts. And no doubt it fell upon these individuals' ears. And there they are with the Saviour, asking questions, no doubt, as to who he is and what he can do for them. It is a wonderful scene to picture. But, of course, distraction and the wiles of the evil one are never far away. Even in times such as this. For in come the Pharisees. And they have this question. And with this question they, they seek to hit multiple targets in one go. Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? It was asked of course directly to the disciples. You're supposed to be Jewish. You're supposed to be going to the temple every week and following the same religion I do. And you're saying that this is your master. How can that possibly be? He's eating with publicans and sinners. Of course, they then take aim at the Saviour as well. If he truly was the Messiah, he's not going to be doing what he's doing now. He's supposed to come into this world and be with men such as ourselves. He's not going to be with tax collectors and the lowest people involved in all sorts of immorality and crime. And of course, they targeted at the publicans and sinners themselves. You are so evil that you're beyond any kind of glimpse from the Lord, from Jehovah. You're far too far gone in your crime. You see how subtle this question is. You see how it comes from the evil one aimed at the many people in that home. But Christ quenches it with one answer. They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Christ Jesus, by answering it in that way, takes the whole context of that question and everything and takes it down to the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue is the issue of the heart. You see, these Pharisees might have been wearing their vestments and all their fancy attire, perhaps saying the right things, going to the right locations, but their heart was not seeking after God, was not seeking after the Lord. Whereas these publicans and sinners knew who they were, 
knew they had a problem, knew that it needed a solution, and they've heard that Jesus is that solution. That means that when, when Jesus speaks of the Pharisees being whole, or a verse later as righteous, does that mean that these individuals were whole and righteous? Of course not. But they perceived themselves to be. And likewise, these, the sick and, and the, those are referred to as sinners, or those that do, know they are sick and know they need healing from the great physician. When we consider Christ under his often repeated title, the great physician, there are a number of things, there are a number of things that stop the whole from coming to him, that hinder the righteous from approaching Christ. But likewise, in the same time, there are many things that draw in sinners to him. Those that need a saviour, why they're drawn into Christ. That's why our theme this night is what stops the whole and draws the sick. What stops the whole and draws the sick. And they're also our two point headings this evening. First of all then, what stops the whole? What resides in the heart of those that perceive themselves as righteous that stops them making any kind of approach truly to the Lord? There are a number of things. One thing which is very, very prevalent in the lives of the Pharisees is pride. Pride residing in the heart. Indeed, when you look at their question, there's pride in it. Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Where's the pride? Well, they ask, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? In other words, he's not my master. I have nothing to do with him. He might be your master, but I have no part with him. I'm my own man. I stand on my own merits. He's not my master. See, the Pharisees, at this time, had things going pretty well. They were enjoying some political favour. They were the, you could say, the popular party, you could say, in that area. They had access to a lot of places. They were pretty well off. Their voice in the, in the society carried weight. So that meant that this Jesus and his ministry, they viewed him, they viewed him as an imposter. He was wreaking havoc on the Pharisees' image with his ministry. You see it in the gospel narratives. They're, they're, he's constantly calling out the Pharisees for their, their sin and their evil. Their pride wouldn't allow that. He was an imposter. Well, friend, apply that to yourself. Is that how you view Christ? Is... Is Jesus Christ, as he is freely offered in the gospel, an imposition upon you? Is he an imposter? Have you got things going pretty well in your life? Things are relatively in order. Things are just dandy the way they are. And you know that this gospel offer would wreak havoc upon your life. That is a great picture, dear friend, in your own heart of the pride of the Pharisees. That's one thing that keeps 
the whole from Christ. Another thing that keeps the whole away, that's jealousy. Jealousy. Again, their question. Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Why is he spending time with them? Pharisees did not like who Jesus busied himself with. They were in many ways their enemies. And this question is similar to what is said in, in Luke's gospel. This man eateth and, and drinketh with sinners. It was said as an accusation, even though it's a glorious truth. But they just thought, no Messiah is going to come and spend time with these people. He would come to me. Have you ever truly asked yourself tonight what the sin of Jonah ultimately was? Why did he flee from the presence of God? Maybe when you were growing up you thought it was just because he was afraid of witnessing. But actually, you read Jonah. He knew that God would be merciful. He just didn't want them to be merciful to the Ninevites. Think of Jonah at that time. He was a prophet to Israel. Israel is in a royal mess. Divided. Worshipping idols. Everything unimaginable to do with the alleged people of God was happening at that time. And then you see the godless Ninevites revived and quickened. You see him be merciful to them. Can you see how Jonah might have come to that conclusion now? The people that have been chosen of God, served God perhaps for many generations, seeming like they've been abandoned. And then the Ninevites are brought in. Something of the sin of jealousy in the heart of the Pharisees is similar. See, as far as they were concerned, all the proofs that, that the Lord laid time and time again that he was the Messiah, in their mind they were all undone. He could heal in the tens of thousands. He could show his claim to be who he was time and time again. But in their mind it was all undone because of who he busied himself with. They thought they deserved messianic attention. Friend, again, ask yourself that challenging question. Christ was in this world, he'd be on my side. The coup I am in and of myself, why would Christ stay away from me? Why is he busy saving people in unimaginably bad lifestyles? Here I am in my best behaviour. Is that in your heart as well? Another thing that was prevalent in the Pharisees is simple denial. Denial keeps the whole away. You think of what's said in John chapter 8. Christ had just said, the truth shall make you free. How did the Pharisees respond to that? We are Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. Their reaction to Christ's wonderful statement was to deny that they had any problem at all. Deny that they had any reason for him to come into this world. An outright refusal to acknowledge the problem of the human heart. The bondage to sin that exists. That is a great sin. The Lord has spoken. He's diagnosed the problem of the human heart in the scriptures. And humanity by and large denies the truth of it outright. That stops the whole coming to Christ. Friend, do you tonight deny that you have 
a need for Jesus. Do you deny that there is a problem with your heart that needs fixed? Do you believe like the Pharisees that you are in bondage to no one? Say you're going along the road one day in your car and a small light pops up on the dashboard warning you of a problem that is underlying. You need to, get the, you need to turn the light off so there's two problems, there's two solutions to that problem. You can either take it to a garage, to an expert, who will diagnose the problem, get it fixed, and that will turn the light out. But also, you can just unplug the light. That will clear your dashboard, but it hasn't cleared the problem. And likewise, friend, if you're busy denying the scriptural claims as to your problem before the Lord... All you're doing is unplugging the light. The light of conscience. The light perhaps telling you of that. And likewise with the card, a denied problem, an ignored problem is a worsening one. And it's the same spiritually. That was denial. A couple of more of them before we move on. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy keeps the whole away from Christ. That was very much a sin of the Pharisees. They were always nearby Christ's ministry. Always in and about the ministry of Christ. In fact, if you think more directly about this context, Jesus is in a private home. And yet, how close were the Pharisees to these events? Verse 11, when the Pharisees saw it. They didn't hear about it from a distant place. They were able to see what Jesus was doing with these people. They were very nearby. In other words, they were always following, but never closing with Christ. Friend tonight, do you have a foot in each camp? Are you trying to serve Christ and mammon? That will keep you from Christ. Closing in with him truly. Because in reality, a foot in each camp is really both feet in one. And that is in the world. Don't let hypocrisy keep you from him. But seek him tonight. Lastly in this point. Heritage. That's an odd one, but it's worth explaining. Heritage keeps the whole away from Christ. We quoted John chapter 8 earlier. What they, when they said they were in bondage to no man, what was the reason they gave? We are Abraham's seed. Because of who we are descended from, that means that we have a claim, that we are perfectly fine the way we are. The Pharisees were very, very proud of their heritage, where they could stem their roots from. Their direct line could be taken back to the days of Ezra, that great exposition of the scriptures. But at the end of the day, they thought their link to Abraham meant natural godliness and a claim to glory. They even had a claim to be a, a, a spiritual descendant of, of proper conservatism, you could say. Because about 150 years before Christ came into the world, they had a, you could say, a split, we would say nowadays, between themselves and the Sadducees, who also we read about in the Gospels. But they were at one time in the same camp, 
but 150 years before Christ. And they had a disagreement and they split about it. And the Pharisees did take the more conservative religious route. And again, they thought that counted for something sal salvifically. Friend, are you perhaps settled in family heritage? Perhaps you knew someone in your parents or your grandparents who was very godly. Surely I can't be cast away because, well, my grandfather was a godly man. I can't be cast away. My, my, my mother would always pray for me. Don't settle in that, friend. Seek him yourself. Likewise, if we can take an application from the, the division between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, don't be settled merely in church heritage. Because whatever decisions that were, of course, necessary happened in the past and you might agree with does not mean that gets you a pass into glory in and of itself. Remember all these things. All these things we have just spoken about were all the mind of the Pharisees. And they will keep you from Christ. They stop the whole from coming to him. But secondly then, what draws the sick? What are some of the things that help draw in the sinners? Those who know their need and to look for a solution to that need. What draws them in? A number of things we'll lay out. One thing is the Lord's gracious condescension. His gracious condescension. You think of our context here at this time. Matthew just calls it the house in chapter 10, but Mark in the same account specifies it as Matthew's house. The Lord had just called Matthew. He was sitting at the receipt of custom at work. Tells him to follow him. Where? Home. That is how the Lord so condescended graciously to Matthew. Sitting at the receipt of custom. An outwardly immoral man called in the gospel and brought home. To reside with Christ. Think of another notorious publican, Zacchaeus. Come down, for I must reside with you tonight. Don't be tempted tonight, dear sinner, if you think, to, to think that Christ cannot dwell with you. Do not let the devil tell you that you are too far gone or that the Lord would never condescend to such a sinner. He has done here. That is one of the things that pulls in sinners to Christ. His condescension into this world to save sinners. Linked to that is another thing. His approachableness. His approachableness. Again read verse 10. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Behold many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. It wasn't just Matthew that was pulled in to Matthew's house. But if you think about it, how many people would Matthew have known? Think of how many of these publicans and sinners might have been going about their business knowing it's wrong, knowing they needed healing, but they thought, well, there's no hope for me because of who I am. And then they hear about Matthew. One of our own has been called by this Messiah to follow him. 
Is there hope for me after all? And they're drawn in. Publicans and sinners, wicked, immoral men who had done evil are pulled in to the salvation offered in Christ. In other words, we can put it this way, the one without sin was with sinners. And I find it hard to find anywhere in the Gospels where Christ was so approachable as this moment. As far as outwardly looking in, when you see droves of publicans and sinners coming to seek him, does he turn them away? Does he stay isolated? Does he stay distant from them? No, he doesn't. Just a few years ago, we had the lockdown. You couldn't see a doctor during lockdown. They were distant, they were far off. You had to be on the phone, you had to do various other things. But you can draw near to Christ with all your illness, with all your disease of sin, and he will draw near to you. On that basis, what impression do you have of Jesus tonight? In this context, you are to see him as a physician. His approachableness. Another thing that draws sinners in is his mission. Or as we can say, his oath. Doctors and those in healthcare are to take what's called the Hippocratic Oath. They have a reason and a, a guard as to what they can do. Well, Christ's mission is summed up really well by the Apostle Paul when he writes to Timothy. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And again, you think of sinners in this context, those who know who they are and what they are, those who knew their sin and their standing before God, Well, glory to God, it is those he came for. James Thornwell, American theologian, said, Let the sinner believe firmly in the atonement of Jesus, and he can look to heaven without horror or dismay, for he sees there an approving Father and a smiling God. That is Christ's mission that he came and that he was successful in. So don't be tempted to think tonight, well, I need to recover first. I'm too much heavy laden with sin. I need to do a bit of reforming of my life before I come to Christ. Would you ever say that to a doctor? I'll come and see you when I'm better. That is the point in this statement by the Lord. You do not consider your need if you think that, if you do, you do not consider the Lord as a physician if you're saying, I'll come to see you when I'm better. You think of what's said in a, a well known verse in Isaiah chapter 1. Come and let us reason together. What is said? Though your sins were a scarlet? Of course not. Though your sins be a scarlet. You and all your scarlet sins, now, they shall be white as snow. And he has time for you. This is another thing to do with his mission. He comes to save sinners. There's no waiting lists with this physician. There's no delays, nothing. It's a lengthy chapter, chapter 9. But it was worth reading the whole chapter. Because in the whole chapter you see that he has time for sinners. You have him here in this house. Dealing with the publicans and sinners. Then come the Pharisees. Then come John's disciples. Then comes uh, the 
centurion, come and heal my daughter. Just as he's on the way there, some woman pulls in the hem of his garment. In any of these situations, did the Lord say, I don't have time for you? Especially when you're talking about someone who is dead. The woman comes and tugs in the hem of his garment. Time is off the essence. I don't have time to see her. Or does he stop and turn to her? Friend, remember these things. They pull in sinners. His mission to save sinners. Here's something else interesting. His diagnosis. You could say his honesty. Pulls in sinners. Verse 12. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. It is not a great deal of speculation to assume that the publicans and sinners heard Jesus saying this to the disciples, to, to the Pharisees. He heard, they heard Christ calling them sick. He heard, they heard him calling them sinners. But that's a glorious thing in their own mind. He's not going to lie to me. He's going to diagnose my problem truly, and that's what I need. There's many false gospels out there today, friends, where false diagnoses are given out. All is well with your soul, as it is. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. That does the sinner no good. When there is a problem, honesty is necessary. It is required. You think of a woman at the well of Samaria who, you would say, had a strange evangelism statement. Come and see a man that told me all things that ever I did. You go and share the gospel in that way to someone on the street. Someone who's, sent, who's trying to hide their sin. I don't want that exposed. But the sinner seeking Christ wants all his sins, her sins, pardoned and covered. Coming to the honest physician. Think of Psalm 139. The well-known words of Psalm 139. Speaking of the, the knowledge of God, there's nowhere, nothing that hides from him. That's a terrible thought to a hypocrite. But you think of the last two verses of that psalm and what the psalmist says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me and root out all evil. The one who knows all things and Christ Jesus, with his honesty, his diagnosis, is what draws in sinners. Today, dear friends, and I hope this is not anyone here, people tend to want affirmation for their sins. They want people to celebrate their sins. But the one seeking Christ, rid me of my sins. Show, show your mercy to me. Do you accept tonight the biblical truth concerning your soul? Do you accept the biblical diagnosis of your problem? That from the top of your head to the sole of your feet lies no good thing. That even your best works are filthy rags. If so, you should be drawn into Christ who knows all things. Because the very one who knows the exact extent of your sin is the one who paid the price that the exact extent would be covered. Where grace, where sin abounded, grace doth much more abound. 
A couple more briefly before we close. His cure. His cure draws in the sick. We have it in verse 2. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of, pal sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Seeing their faith. Friend to the sinner who yearns for salvation, there is a beautiful simplicity in faith. This is a, a cure as well that covers all. It's one cure. The same cure for each and every one of you here tonight. For your sin is faith. <coughs> nothing extra, nothing taken away. All through faith. And all kinds of sin are healed through faith. So nowadays, you have doctors that are more specialist. You have someone, you go to see someone about your back or you go to see someone about your bones or whatever else it may be. But Christ heals all. Christ heals all. Maybe you're thinking, oh, the, the solution is too simple. It can't be that simple. It must be something far more complicated than that because of my situation. It's not. They did. Paul and Silas did not lay out a list of qualifications to the Philippian jailer. <coughs> Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Finally, what's another thing that draws in the sick to this physician? His bill. His bill. Think of what Paul said to the Romans. By the offence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. The free gift of the gospel. You see, this, this truth is an absolute affront to the proud. The proud say to themselves, there must be something that I bring to the table. I must have something in my heart, something in my deeds, whatever it may be, that draws God's attention. But the sinner ever gives thanks to God because he knows and she knows there is nothing in him or her to solve the problem. Nothing in my hands I bring. Because there's nothing in you. It's a free gift. Sinners are drawn in to the free offer of the gospel. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the water of life freely. The spirit and the bride say come. Freely, without what, without money and without price. Drawn in to the richness that is the Saviour. John Gill said this, and I think it sums up everything we've spoken about rather well. None ever went from him without a cure. None ever perished under his hands. The disease he heals never returns again to prevail so as to bring about death and judgment, and he does all freely, without money and without price. Which group do you see yourself in tonight? The whole from the first point, or the sick from the second point? Friend, acknowledge your sickness, and acknowledge the physician, Come to faith in him today and do not delay. Not merely because it is a sin to do so, 
but because there won't be any delay on his part. He delights to save sinners. Hear that tonight in the gospel. May the Lord bless these thoughts to us this night. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious and ever-blessed Lord, we give thanks for the wonderful message of the gospel. We give thanks, O Lord, for the condescension of the Saviour into this world, that there is indeed a gospel to preach at home. For we are unworthy of the very least of your mercies tonight. But we, O Lord, pray that as Christ is offered in the gospel, that we be persuaded and enabled to embrace him. O Lord, we pray, may the Spirit bless the word to us this night as it has gone forth. Bless us in our parting praise. Be with us in safety as we return to our homes. Cleanse us from all our sins, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. We'll close singing some verses from Psalm 33. And from verse 18 to the end of the psalm. <clears throat> psalm 33 from verse 18. Behold on those that do him fear, the Lord doth set his eye. Even those who on his mercy do with confidence rely. From death to free their soul, and darth life unto them to yield. Our soul doth wait upon the Lord, he is our help and shield. Sith in his holy name we trust, our heart shall joyful be. Lord, let thy mercy be on us, as we do hope in thee. These last three verses from Psalm 33. Behold on those that do him fear, the Lord doth set his eye. Once again, bless us and keep us the rest of this night, and we shall remain here no longer. <clears throat>